We're together to worship the Lord our God, sing praises to him. We pray that uh, together as uh, we sing praises to him and as we minister to each other, hear the word and then uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together. That Jesus Christ would be praised, that you would be comforted and strengthened. Welcome to all of you who are visiting with us this evening as well, or those of you worshiping with us online. Let's uh, sing together for our pre-service songs. First of all, number 338, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And then from the Spiral Book, Song Supplement C12, we'll sing stanzas one and four, Yet Not I, but, or Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. After that, we'll join in silent and personal prayer.
Let's lift up our hearts to the Lord. There in glory we read, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Grace, mercy, and peace unto you from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together from 116b, stanzas 1, 2, 3, 9, and 10, the first three and the last two. Let's take this time now to go to our Heavenly Father in our evening prayers. <clears throat> oh Lord our God, what a joy and a privilege it is to have freedom, to heed the call to worship, blessed by the elders who have made sure that all is prepared and ready, together with the deacons to make sure that our offerings and our giving and prayer may be uh, manifested, that we love you. Together we come, Father in heaven, all with our own time and prayer and preparation and making ready to serve and worship you. We ask, Heavenly Father, a blessing on our time together, that the word would go forward as we confess it, 
in strength and in boldness and truth, especially what we believe about the body and uh, the blood, the bread and the wine of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, as we head back in time to that last Passover meal and that first Lord's Supper, we ask, Father in heaven, we would have a deepened understanding of you, that the more deeply we understand you, the more we'll love you and give our hearts to you, to serve you. And Father, even in this time of prayer, we come to you to honor you, to thank you for the gifts of life and new life of so many in the congregation who experience you in different marvelous ways. Yes, Lord, there are some who are really struggling and, and grappling with things. Sometimes, Father, things too big for us to understand. And in our smallness, Lord, we can cry out to you and that you incline your ear and you hear us. And then, Father, we say we love you. We love you for that. And thank you, Father in heaven, that you have blessed us with children and that, Lord God, there are now mothers again expecting, carrying little ones. But for others, Lord, that can mean pain and a wrestling because they have not been given that same gift. Together, Lord, may we love one another, bear each other's burdens, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Lord, many of us are, are going to be traveling to different places around the globe in the coming weeks. This week as well, we pray for our brother, Pastor John, and his family as they'll head this way to be with uh, John and Marianne, and we pray, God, you would bless them together, the family, and bless their time. We ask, God, also that you would bless those who are headed back uh, from, uh, Ed, or from Calgary later on tonight, and, and Father in heaven, we know that the weather does not seem to be looking too good over the next couple of days. Again, others will be heading to a nice warm time to rest and be refreshed and relaxed. We ask God also that you would be with uh, our brother Dave's dad who could use your presence and your nearness and your guidance. And uh, we pray with Dave for his dad. We ask God that you would also uh, be with Kate as she leads us in song and music. Bless her preparation and time. And Lord, give her a sense of peace and joy about all of this. For me too, as I bring the word, that all nervousness and trepidation would be cast aside, all arrogance too. And that Father in heaven, we might grow in the marvel of your word. And then that word applied by the sacrament. May we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who is worthy because he was slain and he lives again, the Lion of Judah, our King. Amen. As we make ready to hear God's word about the Lord's Supper, let's sing 196, At the Lamb's High Feast we sing.
Let's turn to Luke's gospel this evening, the 22nd chapter, and we'll pick up the reading at verse 7, and we're going to read then through verse 25. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 7, page 1,627. So the inspired Luke writes, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large furnished upper room and there make ready. So they went and found it just as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup and gave thanks, and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to, or thus, yeah, there was also a, a dispute among them as to which of them would be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs is he who serves. For who is greater? He who sits at the table, or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. Thus far the reading of God's holy word, and then we're going to look at our Heidelberg Catechism and the, what we confess about the Lord's Supper, Lord's Day 28, and in our form and prayer book you'll find it on page 230. Page 230 in our form books. How does the Holy Supper remind and assure you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice in the cross and in all his benefits? In this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup in remembrance of him. With this command comes these promises. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup shared with me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. Second, as surely as I receive from the hand of him who serves and tastes with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord, giving me as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his poured out blood? It means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ and in this way to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more. Through the Holy Spirit who lives both in Christ and in us, we are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so also he is in heaven and we are on earth. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And we forever live on and are governed by one spirit as the members of our body are by one soul. Where does Christ promise to nourish and refresh believers with his body and blood as surely as they eat this broken bread and drink this cup? In the institution of the Lord's Supper, the Lord in the night when he was betrayed broke bread or took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes this promise is repeated by Paul in these words the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not the participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake 
of the one bread. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, what a night that must have been for Jesus Christ. With fervent desire, so the desire is, is simply or not just simply, a, I can't wait, you know, like when we wait for Christmas dinner or we wait for Thanksgiving dinner, that there's something deep going on in Jesus Christ. It's a very passionate time. It's a very powerful time. Because Christ is not only preparing for his own death, which he knows is going to happen very soon. His disciples do not. But he's also preparing because he's going to leave them and he won't drink the uh, wine and he won't eat the bread until he comes in his kingdom again. So he's thinking about them too and how to, how to keep them strong and how to keep them encouraged. So he wants to spend this last time in teaching them and in loving them and consoling them. And he comes up with a meal, a new meal, a meal that takes the place of the old meal of the Passover and yet we see that marvelous connection and then we even see that the greatness and the honor that it is the person who is greatest who sits at the table, not the one who serves. Jesus, the servant. Jesus, the, the one who washes people's feet. Jesus, the one who gives up his position in heaven and becomes lowly even unto death. Jesus, who really does love his people. <clears throat> Jesus is the shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for his sheep, and he's going to, and he knows it. And I don't know, men, sometimes, if, if we really think about this, how courageous Jesus is. For all the uh, different things that we talk about Christ, but the man, the Son of God, is utterly courageous. He could go, he could run away, he could do miraculous things and hide, but he will not, because he loves God the Father, and he loves his disciples, and, and he loves you. And that's what we come to celebrate this evening at the Lord's Supper table. So I got to speak to our Sunday school class today, and lots of them are here. And what did we talk about? What does the Lord's Supper remind us? And remember, we said it reminds us of the song that you sang. Jesus loves me, this I know. That he died and he bled to take away our sins. And that's really what this is about and, and again you know the lord's supper is so marvelously simple and yet we can make it so busy and so complex and make it so difficult whether it's be what we all expect in a profession of faith or what it is we expect from those who take it and and then even how people expect from themselves how dare i come to the lord's supper table i, I sh how do i even dare come in my own wickedness and sin and, and there's preachers that preach this and, and I know that there's preachers and, and elders and, and some of the older members. We know people, don't we, that, that would not come to the table of the Lord because they felt they were so miserable and despicable and dirty. And that's exactly who the Lord's Supper is for. It's for men like those disciples. Oh yeah, we're going to find out about Judas Iscariot. Woe to him. But Jesus says, come to the table now. I gently call you. It is to receive by faith the work of Jesus Christ and to believe that your sins are forgiven because of his death and because of his resurrection. But it's also to believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit that if we come, especially when we're weak in faith, when we're at our weakest, that's exactly when we need to come to the table. How many of you eat a lot when you're full? Don't we come when we're hungry? And, and we're almost needy, that, that we're feeling faint without this food. I know it's hard to understand it because it's just a little piece of bread. And it's a little piece of, or a little glass of wine. But, beloved, really, for us, it is a feast because of the fullness of Christ that dwells within us. So we hope to pull in a few things that we're doing with the Gospel of John and looking forward in two weeks when we... If the Lord wills it, that we will go to John chapter 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and unless you eat my bread, or eat my body and drink of my blood, you cannot live. We're going to pull in some of those things, children, that we talked about in Sunday school this morning, but we're going to pull in from the catechism what Jesus did on that special night when he institutes the covenant meal, replacing the passionate Passover with a passionate preparatory supper. So Jesus is in Jerusalem for his last Passover. 
And it is historically the last Passover that is ever needed. We don't need Passover anymore because of what Christ has done. And Christ now is going to ensure, though, that this will be a powerful moment, and the Holy Spirit is going to ensure that all the gospel writers will write about this moment and what's going on. Luke tells us it was the day of unleavened bread. That's a little bit hard for us to understand exactly what that means. We think it means that that was the day when they got all the leaven out of the house. So now we've got to remember what Passover was about and where it came from. So we remember Israel, and Israel is in Egypt land, and Pharaoh will not let the people go. And God has brought nine plagues, each one more horrible than the last, each one an attack on their God. And now he says... To the people of Israel, I want you to do two things. I want you to prepare a meal, and I want that there will be no leaven in the bread, which means it will be cooked quickly. It's not going to be the easiest to eat. And I want you to prepare a lamb, and I want it that it is a male lamb, and it is the best lamb that you have without blemish. Now, I don't know that the Israelites completely understood, but they were to then cut the throat of the lamb. They were to catch the blood in a basin, And then they were to take hyssop, and they were to paint that hyssop over the door joist, or the door jamb. And then God had commanded the angel of death that whenever he saw that blood over the doorpost, he was to pass over that house. But of course, the Egyptians didn't do that. And the Egyptians were not told to do that. And if they were looking at the Israelites, they didn't do that. And any Israelite who didn't do it woke up the next morning And all the oldest children were dead. And it seems also the oldest animals as well. It was horrible. It was brutal. Remember what we said this morning, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And Pharaoh was to blame. He wouldn't let the people go. But for Israel, that meal then was codified in the law And that every year on Nisan 14, the month of Nisan on the 14th day, they were to gather together and to come to Jerusalem, and if they couldn't, then to do that in their homes, and to slaughter a Passover lamb, and to have a Passover meal, and it was to begin with the oldest son, and then the father would ask the son, my son, what do we remember on this day? And then the son would tell the story of how Israel passed out of Egypt with all of their families together. Pharaoh distraught and destroyed, said, get out of here, go. And as we sang about it in hymn 196, they left Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his hosts were drowned, and they came into the promised land. It is the great redeeming act of the Old Testament. And they're always remembering that. Psalm 116 that we went through this week actually is one of those halal psalms that is an Egyptian halal, an Egyptian hallelujah. Remember how the Lord God, when we were near to death, got us out of that land and we walked in the land of the living. And that anyone who did die on the way, precious in the eyes of the Lord, was the death of one of his saints. And they praise God for what he has done. And so then they back to Jesus there on that day of unleavened bread. They made sure that the room was clean. They would have needed 13 cots and a couple of tables. And then Peter and John would have to go and get the Passover lamb. And they would have to make sure that that lamb was properly slaughtered and then skinned, cooked in a proper way, and butchered. And then they would bring that lamb together with the unleavened bread and then in the times of the intertestament in the days say of esther and moving on with the feast of purim and other things there was added to the passover a celebration of seder which had something to do also with the exile after or from the return home after the exile that's where the cups and the wine and all of that comes from jesus embraces those things even though they're not commanded in the law which is interesting when we think about worship And then Jesus sat the brothers down and he began to talk with them. And I think what's always interesting when Jesus teaches them, and children, remember we talked about that in the the Passover and the Lord's Supper this morning, that we we asked, right, what, what was the meat? And it was a lamb. And that 
Jesus was looking at that lamb who was dead on a platter, and Jesus is going to be as dead as that lamb on the platter. I mean, I don't think we can ever really understand what is going through the heart of Jesus Christ. I will be as dead as that lamb with its throat slit. But it's that Passover lamb, he says, that is now going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That something new, something great, something more wonderful is going to happen. That with the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, we will no longer need to shed the blood of a lamb. Now, if you want to go have a a Passover meal and see what that's like, you can go do that. You're free to do that. But we don't need to do it anymore. We're not commanded. Jesus says, I'm going to fulfill that now. And the kingdom of God is going to come into its presence. And he's looking at them. And he, he looks at them and he realizes that they're suffering. They're, they're unsure. They don't know what to do. From his place of suffering, he's still the one who cares for the sheep. He's the shepherd who's going to become that lamb on the platter, and yet he's looking at those sheep there, and he says, I've got to take care of them. I've got to watch over you. And so everything then, like we said, was made ready, and he found them. And I'm not going to go into all the details about the man with the pitcher and all of that. We'll take that up at another time, I hope. But now when the hour of Kiat had come, he said, I desire to eat with you when I will no longer eat it. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said, this is my body which is for you, this is remembrance of me. So do you see you have the eating of the Passover lamb, which ends up at the cup of thanksgiving, and now he moves it, and he takes bread, and he breaks that bread, and he says, this is my body. Now, when I went to the Sunday school children this morning, I said, is that piece of bread really Jesus' body? And they all said, no, it's not Jesus' body, it's bread. Now, either you are really doing a phenomenal job that your four-year-olds are really reformed, or I think they get the simple obviousness of it. Because that would even be a little bit gross if that really was Jesus' body. By the way, do you know that the Roman Catholics for a long time never gave the cup to the congregation because the body was the body and the blood. So if you ate the wafer, you had the body and the blood in, in the real thing, and The children know that it's bread. And the bread points to what Jesus is going to give. And it points to that eating. So we talked about what happens to the bread after you eat the bread. Well, it becomes part of you. It becomes one with you. So Jesus actually gives himself through the Holy Spirit and then reminds us of that reality by saying this is my body take it and eat of it because i'm going to leave i'm going to come again and i will celebrate all these things with you but in preparation for my coming because really that's what the lord's supper is it's a preparation for his coming it's supposed to be a little taste of heaven A little taste of the wedding feast between the groom, the bridegroom, and and the bride that he loves. In the fortification of Jesus died on the cross for our sins. His body was broken. Not his bones, but his skin. He was beat up. He was bruised. He was cut. He hung on a cross. They pierced his hands and his feet. They pierced his scalp with a a thorny crown. And then he hung there on that cross and he was dead. How did they know he was dead? Well, we read that they weren't sure, so they took a spear and they poked it in his side, and and the blood flowed out, mingled with water. He was dead, and he had given his blood as a complete remission of all our sins. And he says, I want you before I come to think about that every time you drink that glass of wine. That I gave my blood for you. 
And you need to drink it with the understanding that you are forgiven. And you need to drink it when you're feeling like you're not. And he says, I'm going to make the whole Bible, I'm going to make it very simple. I'm going to make that whole story of Passover very simple for you. Because if you eat of my bread and you drink of my wine, if you eat of my body and drink of my blood, I will paint my blood over the door frame of your heart. And the angel of death will pass over you on the day of judgment. You will be redeemed from the slavery of the Egypt that is your sin and your death and your misery. I love you. And I want to take care of you. And I'm going to feed you. And I want you to understand. And, and then, you know, even Judas Iscariot is there. And can you imagine now what that supper must be loading upon him as he goes to do his diabolical deed, and yet he's willing to reject it. He's willing to, to just absolutely deny it. I don't want your bread. I don't want your wine. I don't want your body and your blood, Lord Jesus. I am going to sell you out. Now, okay, woe to that man. It has been decreed that he would do that. But the rest of the disciples are coming in their own arrogance. Who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus just must be going, ah, oh, I'm going to die a shameful death on the cross. My God is going to forsake me. I am dying because you people are so utterly ignorant. You can't do it yourself. You don't even know how wicked you are. That's what my death is all about. And you're worried about who's going to be the greatest? I just made you the greatest. I said, you sit at my table. King Jesus is saying, sit at my table, beloved. Now the shepherd becomes the king. And he's a shepherd king. Trudeau's not asking us to sit at his table. Ford's not asking us. Putin certainly isn't. Biden isn't. But the ruler of the world is saying, come and eat with me. Come and fellowship with me. I've made you prophets, I've made you priests, and oh yeah, I've made you kings. It's a remarkable thing. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he who governs as he who serves, let them be like me. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I'm among you as the one who serves. Think of your Jesus. Yet I am among you as the one who serves still today. Who else does that for you? Who, who, who speaks to you that lovingly? Who else do you know? Your husband, your wife, we don't. Your father, your mother, we don't. Your children. Nobody speaks like that to you, that lovingly, that sacrificially, that sacramentally. From the passion that is within him, he says, yeah, but I need it to be well with you. And I need you to be strong. And I need you to be sure that as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? What does it all mean? To accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ in this way, to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life and forever live on and be governed by one spirit as the members of our body are governed by one soul. The Lord Jesus says, I am coming, but I know that there are times when you're filled with despair and you're struggling and you're working hard and I know you get hungry sometimes, and I know you get thirsty sometimes. And we go to John 6, we're going to read, Jesus says, and I am the bread of life. Eat me and, and you'll never hunger again. We've already seen from John chapter 4, I'm the water of life, we'll never have to thirst again. If you drink of his body and you drink of his blood, you are forgiven. It will be well with you. You, you will have his salvation. Receive him by faith as he presents himself through the supper. And then by the Spirit, be strengthened and fortified. It's not just a symbol. There's something real that's going to happen in here in the next 15 minutes. When you take and you eat and you drink and you remember and you believe, 
that we have a complete remission for all our sins in the body and the blood of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Let's uh, sing together number 197 as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. That we may attend to the supper uh, properly, I invite you to turn with me to page 39 in our form books, and you'll see there the heading, Celebrating Our Salvation in Christ. And on behalf of the consistory, uh, I invite uh, the following to celebrate with us. Uh, Janet Kunstra of uh, Providence FRC, Joel and Sa uh, Sarah Elgersma from Bethel URC in Woodstock, Anita Brower from Trinity, uh, in St. Catharines, Scott and Jesse Lobidzo from Grace FRC and Grace Covenant OPC, um, also Elizabeth Hebert and, uh, from the Tilsonburg ARP, Derek King from Providence Community Church, also in St. Catharines, and uh, Tony Verboon from the Maranatha CRC of Cambridge. We're thankful that you're here with, uh, with us, and may the Lord feed you and strengthen your souls. <clears throat> then let's turn to the form. Let us also consider the purpose for which our Lord has instituted the supper, that we should do this in remembrance of him, and this is how we remember him by it. First, let us be fully persuaded in our hearts that our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the promises made by our forefathers in the Old Testament, was sent by the Father into this world, that he assumed our flesh and blood, that he took upon himself for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished eternally, that from the beginning of his incarnation until the end of his life, 
He fulfilled for us all obedience and righteousness of the divine law. This was especially evident when the weight of our sins and of the wrath of God caused him to sweat drops of blood in the garden. He was bound so that we might be loosed from our sins and afterward he suffered countless insults so that we might never be put to shame. Let us con confidently believe that he was innocent yet not put to death or yet put to death that we might be acquitted on the day of judgment and that he even allowed his own blessed body to be nailed to the cross so as to cancel the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and doing so, he took from us the curse and bore it himself so that he might fill us with his blessing. He humbled himself to the very deepest reproach and anguish of hell in body and soul on the cross when he cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did all this so that we might be accepted by God, never to be rejected by him. Indeed, with his death and the shedding of his blood, he confirmed the new and eternal covenant a covenant of grace and reconciliation, when he said, it is finished. In order that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, during the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup when he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That is... <clears throat> As often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, as a sure reminder and pledge, you shall be admonished and assured of my great love and faithfulness toward you. Because you otherwise would have suffered eternal death, I give my body and blood for you in my death on the cross. And as certainly as this bread is broken before you and this cup is given to you, and with your mouth you eat and drink in remembrance of me, so surely do I nourish and refresh for everlasting life your hungry and thirsty souls with my crucified body and shed blood. From the institution of this Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he directs our faith to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross as the only foundation of our salvation. By this sacrifice he has come to our hungry and thirsty souls, the true food and drink of life eternal. For by his death he has taken away the cause of our eternal death, misery, our sin. And he has also obtained for us a life-giving spirit who dwells in Christ our head and enables us who are his members to have communion with him and made partakers of his riches, including life, eternal righteousness, and glory. Besides, by this same spirit, we are also united as members of one body in true Christian love, as the Apostle Paul says. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. As many grains are ground to prepare one loaf of bread, and as many grapes are pressed together to produce wine, so we who by true faith are incorporated into Christ shall be one body through Christian love for the sake of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. He loved us so greatly in order that we might show his love toward one another, not only in words, but also in deeds. May the mighty, almighty, merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ help us in this through his Holy Spirit. Amen. That we may obtain all these blessings, let us humble ourselves before God and with true faith implore him for his grace. Merciful God and Father, we cherish the blessed memory of the death and sufferings of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that in this supper, this supper, you will also work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that with true confidence we might give ourselves up more and more unto your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that this might allow our burdened and contrite hearts to be nourished and refreshed with the true body and blood of him who is true God and true man, the only heavenly bread. Empower us to no longer live in our sins, knowing that he lives in us and we in him. May we truly be partakers of the new and everlasting covenant of grace. May we not doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father, who does not impute the guilt of our sins to us, and who provides us with all that we need for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us also your grace, that we may take up our cross cheerfully, deny ourselves, confess our Savior, and in all tribulation, with uplifted head, expect our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. There he will make our mortal bodies like unto his glorified body and take us to be with him in eternity. Answer us, O God and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. By this holy supper, we may also be strengthened in the Catholic undoubted Christian faith, of which we make profession with heart and mouth. And let's rise and say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. That we may be nourished with Christ, the true heavenly bread. Let us not cling with our hearts to the external things like bread and wine, but lift our hearts to heaven, <clears throat> where our advocate, Jesus Christ, is at the right hand of his heavenly Father, where the articles of our Christian faith direct us. Let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit, as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him. The bread which we break is a communion in the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
take and eat. Remember and believe that the precious body of our Lord and Savior was given unto a complete remission of all our sins. The cup of thanksgiving which we bless is a communion in the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
take and drink. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord and Savior has been given unto a complete remission of all our sins. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God shows his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Therefore my mouth and heart shall show forth praise of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And we all say, Amen. Let's pray. O merciful God and Father, we thank you with all of our hearts that out of your boundless mercy you have given us your only begotten Son for a mediator, the sacrifice for our sins, and as our food and drink unto life eternal. We thank you that you give us a true faith whereby we become partakers of these benefits. And you have united us to Christ and to each other in the communion of saints. You have given your sons for us, uh, for us and to us and have proclaimed a saving death to the whole world having signified and sealed the atoning sacrifice of your Son for us, we ask that you would, by your Spirit, also make us witnesses to this good news among our neighbors. Strengthen us in faith to live gratefully in this present age as we await our Savior's return in glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's respond then with those beautiful words of Psalm 150, setting C. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
Our offerings for this evening are for Edu Deo and then the Benevolence Fund. And after the deacons have received your offerings, we'll sing, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. May the Lord bless your giving.
Then a voice from the throne said, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him both small and great. And as I heard, it were as it were a voice of a great multitude, as a sound of many waters, and as a sound of the mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arraigned in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I am coming. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all your hearts. Amen.